It's probably too late to be having coffee. Hello, welcome back. It has been a minute since I posted anything on here. I wanted to talk about my top 10 favorite books of the year before we get too far into January. I feel like in, um, in you, if you follow me on Instagram, you already know this, but I read a total of 109 books this year. That's a really good number. It's less than what I read last year, but more than the previous two years, I think. Um, and I, I truly, I set my goal at 52 on Goodreads. I truly did not expect to read that many this year, um, but I did. And it's been filled with really, really good books, honestly. I also, one of the things that I did this year was pick from my TBR jar, which that's a series that I show and pick from on TikTok. So you can follow me on there. And I share it on Instagram as well. But yeah, I, I think that my my top 10 list this year, um, I feel like the first four or five uh, were without any doubt, no questions asked, knew immediately they were going to be one through four or one through five. But um, the latter half of the list was a little bit harder just because, again, I think I've read a lot of good, um, a very eclectic list of really, I really feel like 2023, I got out of my comfort zone with reading, which has been really fun and interesting and really something that I'm looking forward to continuing in 2024. So yeah, without further ado, let's just get into the list. So number 10 on my list took me by complete surprise. That's probably going to be a theme for like almost all of the books that I'll be showing you, but um, this was one that I actually read in December. So I finished it literally right before the year ended. It was a book, it's been on my shelf for a long time. It was a TBR jar poll and it just blew me away, honestly. And that's um, The House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. This is an eerie, witchy, grotesque novel, but it was so beautifully written. In it, we are following three girls, three sisters. Um, we're in the perspective of the youngest sister, Iris, but the three of them, when they were children, were kidnapped and they were gone for a whole month. No one could find them anywhere. And then out of nowhere, all of a sudden they turn up again in the middle of the woods, practically starved, naked, dirty, um, and their parents, of course, are very relieved to have them back, but they notice that something's not quite right with them. Their eyes have changed color and their hair has begun to turn white and they now have these special abilities. And so this book now follows them several years later. The youngest sister, Iris, is now 17. And um, the older two sisters have grown, gone off to be very successful in different careers, but the eldest sister has gone missing. And so the other two sisters are now having to come back together and try to find her. So yeah, this is there's mystery to this. There's a bit of a horror aspect to this too. I will, I will tell you also, trigger warning, there's a bit of a body horror aspect to it specifically that I did not expect, which... I don't do well with body horror personally. That's not um, not my thing, not my preference when it comes to any kind of horror stories or uh, micro tropes for horror. But um, I truly thought this gripped my attention from the first page. And it's not a very long book. It's a pretty average size book. Um, this is a new author for me and I just loved her language and the way her prose was very beautiful without uh, beating around the bush. Like she was still very active in her prose. I loved each sister was very distinct and I did not know where the story was going. And it, I just, I would just give this a shot. Again, it's very like, very eerie, very bizarre grotesque like I said but also beautiful and strangely sweet at the same time really took me by surprise I really really like this a lot so the next two books I have again took me by surprise by how much I love them I knew I was going to like them a lot um, also something you should know about me I am not a memoir girly um, I'm not somebody who 
reaches for memoirs all that much at all. It's just not, it's not the genre that I prefer to gravitate towards. Um, I'm very picky about whose lives I'm interested in reading about, whether they're celebrities or political figures or whoever. That being said, three of the books on this list are memoirs. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but it just did. Again, delightful surprise. So that leads me to say number nine is Taste My Life Through Food by Stanley Tucci. I am in love with this man. Stanley Tucci can do no wrong in my eyes. I've always been an avid fan of his. Of course, I think Devil Wears Prada was the beginning of that, but just everything that he does is so good. He's so nuanced in his acting and so subtle, but so impactful. So always been a huge fan of his. But then I also know this about just having like following him on social media and such, obviously he, food is very important to him and his family being an American Italian family. And this was such a cool and unique take on a memoir. At least it was for me, again, as somebody who does not read a lot of memoirs because and it's not very big. It's actually quite short, but he really goes into more about his early childhood and his early twenties and he does talk about his career a little bit. He does obviously bring that in, but really this is a story about his love of his family and his love of his cult, the culture that he grew up in and his love of food. And he incorporates different recipes um, throughout this book, recipes that are really like important to him or have, or have impacted his life in some way. He even has um, one, this one I just pulled up here is actually a recipe for a cocktail, a Negroni. Um, but he has, he has a recipe for a tomato salad. He has them for like pasta and just, I just love this so much. It got me excited, not just about him and his life, but about food. And um, I love to eat, I love Italian food. It's my favorite. Um, so I would say if you're a fan of Stanley Tucci and you like his movies, read this book. because I just think you're going to fall in love with him even more. You know, even though memoirs are not my go-to genre, I have read enough of them to kind of, to really be able to have a pretty firm grasp on uh, understanding when the voice is truly that person's voice. And when I tell you, like, I did not listen to this. I read this and... I could, it was like Stanley Tucci was sitting next to me, telling me this story, telling me his life. It was so clearly his voice, his words, his attitude, his sarcasm, his tone. Um, and sometimes I feel like it can be easy for that to get lost, especially once it goes through the long process, the publication process. Um, but yeah, this just, I loved it. It made me laugh. It made me hungry. Um, and I'm a huge fan of his, so I would give this a shot whether you like Italian food or his work or both. So as I mentioned, along the same vein, three of the books on my top 10 of the year are memoirs. So with that being said, number eight for me was Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing by the late Matthew Perry. Um, this one, so okay, uh, as most of you, as I'm sure know, this was this was published before he passed away in 2023. Um, I believe this was published in 2022 or 2021. Let me, let me, yeah. Okay. This was, this was published in 2022. So the year before I did pick this up, um, uh, after he passed away, I wanted, I, I had already been interested in reading about it just because I'm, I love the, the show friends. Um, Chandler Bing was my favorite character. I know I'm not alone in saying that. Um, one of the first times I ever felt like understood as a person was watching Chandler Bing on TV. So of course I was, I was interested in, in reading about it, but it wasn't until his passing that I was like, okay, I want to read, I want to read his memoir. And this was a surreal, heartbreaking, but very eerie experience. It felt, frankly, it truly felt like he was, saying goodbye. I know that sounds so morbid and I know that's not at all. I don't think that was the intention of the book at all. It, it was difficult to read 
but it was also important to read and it was so poignant and so vulnerable and it just really it blew me away um it made me emotional and it just made my heart hurt so much for this man the amount that he how much he struggled in his life with his addiction the battles he's had to go through with himself but the ending the ending of it was so very hopeful and it's just it is sad so i i, I will tell you it's not exactly I think it's a very bittersweet book, but I do think it's important. And I, I, I loved reading his words. Um, Cause again, this is just another one where I could just, it felt like he was sitting across from me, just chilling, telling me about his life. So this just really impacted me. Um, I don't really get emotional when I read. Um, I get emotional in every other aspect of my life, just not when I read. Um, but this did, it made me, it made me want to cry. Um, and it just, you know, we lost a wonderful, good soul. And it was so worth reading this book. So I would highly recommend if you are, um, I will, I will tell you this. If you are a fan of Matthew Perry, a fan of Friends, definitely read this. But I would also say if you are somebody or you know somebody who struggles with addiction, I would also read this. I think it'd be very insightful. Anyway, very powerful memoir, and I will always, always recommend this to everybody. Okay, switching gears here, something a little bit more on the happier side. Number seven for me was Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. Ah, oh, God. Okay, so I think this book is known to almost everybody at this point, at least for fantasy readers. It is the ultimate cozy fantasy book to read. And um, I actually, I also read the prequel to this, Bookshops and Bone Dust, um, later in the year as well. But I'm only featuring this one because I also gave that one five stars, but this one to me was just perfect in every way. In this story, we are following the orc Viv who has seen many, many battles and she's getting pretty tired of that life and she wants to hang up her sword and travel to a distant land and live a much more quiet life. So she enters this new town and then decides to open up a coffee shop. The problem though is that nobody in this town knows what coffee is and she ends up meeting and recruiting all of these different characters and other creatures and um, races and of, of things to help her put together this coffee shop. And it sounds so silly and so ridiculous, and it is, but it's also the sweetest, most wholesome book I've ever read. And it is an adult book. Like it's for, it, this is a, it's, I wouldn't say this is a children's book, although you could, I guess, kind of, you could read this to children. But to me, this is a children's book written for adults, if that makes any sense at all. Um, Viv is just such a great character. She is a gentle giant who could kill you within a millisecond if she wanted to, but she doesn't. That's the point. All of the characters, all the side characters are so distinct and unique and so sweet and this book just but there's still like the plot itself is super engaging there's so much humor in this about like people trying to figure out what the hell coffee is it just feels like the coziest warm hug i feel like everybody says that about this book but it's so true it is true i do think the hype around this book is valid and if you just if you like fantasy or you want like a low stakes fantasy book and you just want to feel warm and fuzzy and you want to put a smile on your face, I would read this. This just, I think about it all the time. I also had the amazing opportunity to talk to Travis Baldry on Instagram Live. Uh, that video is over on Instagram under my author interviews videos. Um, and he's such a delightful person. <laughs> um, I just love talking to him. Like I said, Bookshops and Bone Dust was um, also very good, but personally, I just, I actually enjoyed this book a little bit more, so that's why I'm including this, but yes, if this is just perfect read to just put a smile on your face. 
Okay, number six on my list is an absolute classic, so this should come as no surprise to anybody, but The Color Purple by Alice Walker. Um, I pulled this also from my TBR jar. I actually think Legends and Lattes is also the TBR jar pull. A lot of these were TBR jar pulls, which is like, again, why I love that project. But anyway, I was, I will tell you, I was terrified. I was terrified to read this. I had, I got it, I got this copy forever ago um, because I knew how incredible it was and how moving it was. And I knew the story-ish, but not all of the specific nuances of it and all the details. I'd never seen the movie, I'd never seen the musical, but I knew that the musical movie it was coming out um, on Christmas day. So very fortuitous timing wise. I was also nervous about it because I am not somebody who does well with epistolary style novels. So novels written in like journal or diary form. I don't know why I just really struggle with books written that way. I don't find, sometimes I don't find the narrative to be quite as active and I, I just start to lose interest over time. So I was a little nervous because this is written in letter form, but by God, this book is, will chew you up and spit you back out, but in the best way possible. This is, if you don't know what the story is, this follows, we are following multiple characters. It's in the perspective of one main character, Celie, but we are following her and other people in her life over the course of about 30 years. Um, starting with, from when she's about 14 and then all the way up to when she's in her 40s. And um, the, I don't even know how to start describing it, but it is following her life. And the book starts with her writing letters to God. Through these letters, she's explaining what's happening in her life. And Jesus Christ, there's just so much that happens. This is a story about perseverance. This is a story about loss and grief. This is a story about strength and overcoming abuse and finding your voice. It, there are so many themes in here. There are themes about race. There are themes about um, men versus women, especially because this takes, I forgot to mention, early 20th century in rural Georgia. So take that for what you will. And it's just, it's a story about sisterhood Oh God, it's just, it's like, I don't, I don't want to say anything else. It's so good. The, the, the characters just, Seely just jumps alive um, off the pages and you just feel so incredibly, I just felt so sorry for her. But then that, all of a sudden that changed and I was just rooting for her so much and all of the characters. Sophia is a fucking riot. I love her. Um, so funny, strong as shit. This is also a story about redemption as well by the end. It's just such a, what a powerful book. And it's, I mean, it's a classic for a reason. It's famous for a reason. So I, I read this immediately, watched the movie, immediately. Uh, the original, the, the original movie with Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah. And it follows the book very closely. There's one thing in the movie they did not, um, they did not, that, that Steven Spielberg did not include um, that was in the book, but, and I don't want to tell you what it is. Um, if you know, you know, but uh, he, I, I read something that he actually admitted later that he regrets not having the guts to include that in there. Um, Cause I do think it's really, that part of it was really important, but I don't want to tell you because it'd be a spoiler. But so anyway, if you, if you are interested in this story and you want to read it, I, 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 I mean, you, you, it's, I mean, it's, it's hefty. This is a hefty book. Um, it will take a lot out of you, but it is important and it is beautiful and it's inspiring and it's hopeful. Unbelievable. I'm so glad I finally read it and I want to watch the musical movie that just came out. So, all right, friends, we're in the top five now. Um, I've already talked about several of these before. In fact, I believe one or two of these have actually ended up in my, um, already ended up in my top favorite books of all time that I filmed. But I also have a new one. My top book read of the year 
has become another one that's top book of all time. So I'll get there. But number five is Carrie by Stephen King. Now, again, another TBR jar pull. This and 112263, which I haven't read yet, but I do want to read it because I only hear good things, um, were the last two books by Stephen King that I owned that I have not read. And I will tell you, I would not consider myself a huge Stephen King fan. I know. I know. Um, my favorite book of his is actually his memoir on writing. I, I'm hilarious. I'm like, I don't like memoirs. And then I talk about, I don't know, four. I'm about to talk about another one. Whatever. Anyway, his, his memoir on writing is my favorite book he's written. It's fantastic. Five out of five stars. His fiction. Um, I'm not the biggest fan. I've read about nine or ten of his novels now. I really liked Pet Cemetery. I really like Salem's Lot. The rest of them, I just haven't really been for me. And I read it. I read The Stand. I, oh, I've also read The Shining. I read The Shining this last year. And again, I just, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I just like something about King just is not clicking with me. Until I read this shit. This, I get it. I get it. Like, reading this, this was his first official published full novel. And I cannot imagine in 1974, picking this up, reading this basically completely unknown author, reading this relative pretty small book and, and completely changing the game in horror novels. And of course this set him in his career for life. I get it. Like the way he builds tension in this in suspense in this book, especially cause it's like, I mean, Carrie at this point, we all know what it's about. And it's like, we know what's going to happen. I knew what was going to happen, but I just kept thinking like, don't, don't go to the prom. Don't go to the prom. Don't go to the prom. And just again, the way he like, I did not know also that he flip flopped back and forth between the actual um, events of the story and then the aftermath and people getting interviewed by the police and the like fake books that came out later uh, by the survivors and all that. I did not know that that was part of the book and I loved that. And again, it's just like this build and build. I also loved the specific, we really got to see more of the backstory of Carrie and her mother. Um, her mother is good night. Her mother is insane, which we know this, but like this, the book really solidifies that. And then by the end and the climax, when we get to, you know, the prom scene, it's so sad, but a little bit satisfying at the same time but then it's like you honestly I forget I think like just because of um like watching the original movie with Sissy Spacek like it's easy to forget at least for me that like she it's not just the school it's more than just the school I mean I don't want to in case you haven't watched the movie or haven't read the book I don't want to give anything away but um all that to say I was very pleasantly surprised by this five stars indeed my besides on writing this is my favorite book of his um and it's it's restored my hope in stephen king work specifically his older work and i'm excited to read i i do want to read 11 63 in 2024 so number four on my list is another memoir this also i talked about this in my favorite uh books ever my top favorite books of all time. I did not, again, expect for it to shoot to the top of the list so quickly, but here we are. Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. Um, I don't wanna repeat myself too much, so you can definitely go look at my other video if you wanna hear me rave about it even more, but um, I've never felt, as a single person in her late 20s, still figuring shit out, <laughs> I've never felt more understood and seen in my life. This is a story about love in all aspects of the word. Um, and I just felt like I could relate to Dolly in so many ways, not just with men, but with friendships as well, with family, with career. And it felt like I was looking into a mirror and she's so funny. She's so funny 
and not in like a cringy way. She just, her, her humor just naturally flows out. It just moved me. This, this book moved me enough because it just felt like someone gets it. So if you were in your 20s specifically, you're like mid to late 20s and you feel a little bit lost, I would give this a read. Um, makes you feel like you're a little bit less alone. Um, and by the end of it, it just put a big smile on my face. So um, definitely huge fan of hers now. We are in the final stretch now, guys. Uh, only three more left. Number three on my list. Again, I've already spoken about it, but Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. Um, another TBR jar pull. I'm telling, I tell us everything I know about love. I think almost all of these were TBR jars except for a couple. That's crazy. Anyway, um, Ariadne by Jennifer Saint. So uh, if you love Greek mythology and you like Greek mythology retellings, please read this book, please. Um, to me, this was up there with Circe by Madeline Miller um, and Tonga McKillies. So if you don't know the story of Ariadne, Ariadne um, is the princess whose half-brother half was the Minotaur and uh, she helped Theseus come in, kill her brother, and then left. So I thought that's what this whole book was going, going to be about because that's really all that I knew about Ariadne's story according to the myth. No, that bit that I just told you happens within first like 30 pages. So when that happened, I was, I was like, uh, what else is in the book? So much. And it just was so gripping. And I don't, I don't, I don't even want to tell you about everything that happens, but she does end up, um, she gets her heart broken. She ends up being a traitor to her kingdom. So she ends up going in exile. She ends up meeting, um, another God. And then she ends up in relations with him and of course that's only recipe for disaster of course always honestly this just this in my opinion this was a story about find another book about finding yourself and finding your strength also a hint of female rage in here which i always like <laughs> it's your heart just fucking breaks for her by the end of it so it's not exactly the happiest story but Jen jennifer saint's writing was so good it was so active while still being very beautiful and almost lyrical and she just completely immerses you into this world from thousands of years ago um and she makes i love the way that she wrote all of the characters but specifically ariadne of course you just can't help but root for her you just want happiness for her so i again i love greek mythology i love greek retellings um this just this just really impacted me personally i definitely want to read more of her work uh i believe she has two or three other books out that i'm definitely going to get my hands on very soon all right number two on the list um and this was this this one was at my number one slot but that recently had to change due to the book, the last book I ended up finishing in 2023. But once again, this is a book I've already been talking about, I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman. I think about this book every damn day. I'm not, I am not joking. And I read it months ago. It is a tiny book. It is less than 200 pages. This story has just stuck with me. It, again, and I, so when I, I will tell you, when I picked up this book, I thought that it was going to be about like uh, female rage, you know, with the, the title um, and considering what the plot summary was, um, which I will tell you in a second. I was wrong. This is not, ha this has nothing to do with female rage at all. This is a story about 39 grown women and one young girl that are trapped in a cage in an underground bunker. You don't know why they're there. They don't know why they're there, but they've been there for years to the point where the young girl whose perspective that we're in, she's anonymous, we don't know her name. Um, she is 14, I believe, 13, 14 at the start of the book. And she's been there almost all her life. She does not know anything else. She does not know the outside world. And this cage that they're in, they are constantly guarded by three or four male guards at all times. And uh, they don't speak to them, they don't do anything with them, but they do feed them multiple times a day and that's about it. One day, 
the guard is opening the cage to feed them, all of a sudden the siren sound and all the guards book it out of there. They leave, they abandon them, but they accidentally leave the door unlocked. So the women are now able to escape their prison and go back up into this world that, that they no longer know. Um, this is a story about the human experience. This is just about what it means to live, what it means to survive, what it means to love, to grieve, to experience loss. And I know I'm sure that sounds boring, but it's not. Like, and she, again, Jacqueline Hartman was able to pack in so much poignancy and meaning into such a tiny book. And it's a little depressing. I won't lie to you, it is a little depressing but I also think it's very moving. And the, the subtle messages in here about just being human, I think about them every day. I will forever be recommending this book. I hope everybody, everybody reads this book. It won't take you a lot of time. Um, it's something I wanna reread. The way, the way that she writes about this girl experiencing things for the first time, blew my mind. Going out and looking at the sky for the first time, touching grass for the first time, climbing up stairs for the first, like things like that. I'm just like, I, it's, it's so mundane that things that we do every day that we've been doing every day since we were born basically that we don't even think about someone having to experience that for the first time. It's just, it's, it's a genius, genius book and has become one of my all-time favorites, period. <sighs> All right, friends, we are at my number one favorite book of the year. Um, I literally finished this on December 31st, okay? So it, it snuck in. I did not expect to finish it before the end of the year. I wasn't like trying to finish it. I just couldn't stop reading it. <laughs> um, and I had no plans that day except for later that night. So. Um, I ended up finishing it and it is my favorite book of the year. It is also now one of my favorite books of all time and specifically, most definitely favorite, one of my favorite fantasy books of all time. No surprise, Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin. I mean, like, <laughs> I, I don't think I need to explain. I think it, this is pretty self-explanatory. He's a fucking genius. Sorry, that was aggressive. Okay, so I love the show. I love the show until I didn't. But I love the show, right? I started watching the show, I don't know, in 2013 probably, early 2014. Um, so not right when it aired, but right as like the third season was airing. And I was hooked, of course, once I started it. And then I was given the first four books, these mass paperback editions, mass market paperback editions, um, in a set back in 2014, so like 10 years ago. And they have been sitting on my shelves collecting dust ever since. And the reason was because I was just enjoying the show and I wanted to just watch the show and enjoy it on its own. I didn't really have any desire to dive into the books yet. And I was like, I'll read, I'll read the books when the show is done. Well, the show has been done for, I don't know, over four years now, right? I can do math, yeah. It's about time. I was like, okay, it's time. Like I've had enough friends ask me, enough followers tell me to just read it. They know I'd love it. And by God, so I'm speechless. Like I, you know, it's like, I know the story so well. I've rewatched the first season the most. So especially the first season, like I know what happens. I know these characters. No, no, you don't know the characters until you've read the book. Sorry. I'd say that now from personal experience. George R. R. Martin is truly the goat of modern day fantasy now, in my opinion. I will always, now listen, y'all know I'm a Brandon, look, I'm a Brandon Sanderson girly. Those are all Brandon Sanderson books right here. I'm a Brandon Sanderson girly. I love Brandon Sanderson. I will always love Brandon Sanderson. But Martin has taken his place for me. Don't tell. I, are, I knew I already loved the world. I knew I loved the characters. I knew I loved the plot. I knew I loved the magic system, everything. But 
being able to be in the minds of these characters, and I said this in my in my post when I posted about it on Instagram, but being able to be in the minds of these characters elevated the reading experience to a height that I did not know it could get to. Like I, I haven't felt this way about a book, about a specifically a fantasy book in a very long time. The way that Martin writes, the way he writes dialogue, the way he builds his world in a way that's captivating and not boring you out the wazoo. Um, and it is, I will tell you, the first half is pretty slow. He has a lot of characters to introduce. He has a lot of uh, different pieces to start to throw onto the board. But once you hit that halfway point, things fly. That's why I told you, I, was like, I couldn't put it down. Like I just, and I knew what was gonna happen. Everything, like all the characters. And also, can I also just say about this, what really threw me for a loop in a good way was realizing just how well the TV show did. Like in when it comes to adapting this book, the TV show is almost, in my personal opinion, the TV show is almost exactly like this first book. And I know they'll start to deviate after season three, book three. That's when things start to get really, really start to, to differentiate. But like the dialogue, the the relationships between all of the characters, just like the plot, everything, they almost did it exactly and that's such a rewarding experience and i would even say if you are somebody who wants to read this but you're intimidated by it um because it's it's intimidating for sure and i mean like i'm i was intimidated going into it um i'm also still kind of intimidated for the rest of the series but i'm very excited to read it i would actually say this is and i'm people may disagree with me on this and that's fine but i would suggest especially if you are not used to reading high epic fantasy like that's not usually the genre that you gravitate towards i would actually recommend watching the show first at least watching the first season first and then reading the book and i think that would help a lot like being able to literally put specific faces in your mind when you're trying to keep track of everybody and everything that's going on picturing places and buildings I think that would really help you out if you want to read this, but are just thinking like, ah, I don't know, it seems too confusing. So all that to say, I didn't really talk about the plot very much, but I don't think I need to. <laughs> We're in Westeros, we follow different houses and different, and we follow different houses in different countries. Um, lots of uh, political sabotage and treason and murder and, you know, all of, all of the good stuff. And, uh, there's a little bit of romance, um, and just don't ever get attached to a character ever, ever in, in Game of Thrones. That's, 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 uh, that is lore. That is law in Game of Thrones. Westeros do not get attached to a character ever, but it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, my, my copy's all beat up cause I've been taking it everywhere, but I'm, I already started. It's January 2nd and I already started Clash of Kings. So, so excited. Favorite book of the year. One of now one of my favorite, probably my second favorite fantasy book of all time, um, Lord of the Rings. Well, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings will always be like top for me. Oh God, so good, so good. If you were thinking about reading this, but you are putting it off for whatever reason, do it, just do it, read it, so good. That's all I'll say. <sighs> okay, that's it, Th that's my top 10. Um, like I said, really kind of eclectic list, uh, different kinds of books, but um, that was a big theme for this year. I read a lot of books out of my comfort zone. Also, I have to say my TBR jar has been one of the best things I've done for myself. That was not my idea, obviously. I think that, I don't know who started it, but the TBR jar, everyone's been, it became a really big trend to do in 2023. Um, and that has been such a fun important project for me because as I mentioned it's gotten me in my comfort zone it's forced me to read books that I have and not getting into a rut of just reading the same like romance after romance after romance or fantasy after fantasy after fantasy whatever right and six of the books that I showed you today six were for my TBR jar wild so it was
was such a great year. Um, honestly, like I, I really, really enjoyed my reading year in 2023, even though I did go through a reading slump that lasted about two months, but clearly did not deter me from reaching my goals and reading some good books. So uh, thank you so much for watching. I know it's been a long time since I've posted anything. I want to be more consistent. I think I'm also going to film my worst books I read this year. I don't know if it'll be top 10, but it'll definitely be just the ones that I DNF because I just couldn't or books I finished and were absolutely terrible. Thank you so much for watching. I love you all and I hope you had a very happy new year. Bye.